we're doing this every month, literally, like every month. Through the rest of the year, we're launching an agency. Hunter is the founder and CEO of Assembly. It's a holding company of productized agencies that he launches with creators. We're already scheduled for like one agency a month through the end of the year. And I'm kind of like, yo, let's build this too. And today, he's launching a YouTube agency with a one creator that actually has a system for growing on YouTube. Oh, this is a YouTube agency. Cool, but it's Ali Abdal's YouTube agency. Hey Friends is the culmination of a really carefully developed partnership between us and Ali Abdal. In this video, Hunter pulls back the curtains into how he launches these companies with creators, how he scales them so quickly, and how you can do the same. There's a really simple formula, honestly. Let's get started. Today, you're launching Hey Friends. What is it and why did you launch it? Hey Friends is the culmination of a really carefully developed partnership between us and Ali Abdal. So most people, I hope, have an idea of who he is. He's long been one of my favorite YouTubers, and it's been this interesting journey to go from just being like a fan of his content and his approach and his clear like discipline to his craft to then seeing that transition into him really building out an opportunity to help people. Right. So Hey Friends is a full service YouTube agency, which is funny to say, because as we did our competitive research, there aren't many, which blows my mind because YouTube is such a huge industry. It's such a big business. So really what Hey Friends does, it focuses on unlocking effortless growth on YouTube. So the whole concept there is that we can take a raw idea and turn that into a perfectly packaged YouTube video that's ready to grow. So it handles everything from research, concept generation, script writing, video editing, animation, storytelling, thumbnail designs, how you structure your video, analytics, optimization, just everything across the board, even publishing the video. The only thing that Hey Friends doesn't do is actually film the video. That's about it. Now we do a whole process to where we can hop on a call with you. We can use Riverside just like this and help somebody set up their YouTube studio, really like dial in camera placement, light, sound, all those things. Um, so we have a process for that um, to really help creators dial that in. Hey Friends, I think is really going to be best for two categories of, of people that we're targeting to start. So the first are creators that have a, an existing audience, but have yet to tackle YouTube. And what we found amongst the creator community, if you look at people that are really influential on Twitter or Instagram, YouTube has been this black box. There is common consensus that like YouTubers are the hardest working creators. And I absolutely agree. Because if you look at the list of things you have to master to succeed on YouTube, it's mind numbing, right? And if you look at even just the hiring that you have to do, like you got to hire script writers, maybe, or you got to hire animators or video editors. You got to figure out how production works. You got to figure out how to think through strategy and analytics. You got to look at categories of content and come up with ideas that are going to succeed. Like it's just, it's daunting, right? Yeah. Uh, there are so many variables with YouTube, whereas Twitter, it's just text. If you can text. write compellingly, it's just one thing. Whereas YouTube, you have the idea, then you have the text, then you actually have to record it and be personable on camera. Then yeah. you have to edit it and have it in such a way that there's like good pacing and people are engaged. And then exactly. you have to think about the analytics too and like retention and then thumbnail design. Yeah. So there's a lot that goes into that. And I'm curious for you launching this, right? Given that mm -hmm. there are so many variables and so many things that you have to service for a client, how yeah. do you think about that? Just straight up, like this is the most... Of the five operating businesses that we have now, this is the most ambitious one to roll out. I think it, it'll have an equal scale to off menu, like off menu has become a really big business really quickly, but I have 15 years of domain expertise there building that agency and thinking through how we scale a design agency, how we do really great brand, really great web work, and then just absolutely crush it for our customers. Like we eat, sleep and breathe that YouTube was interesting because I don't know. I, I'm not a YouTuber. So that's where we, we go through that process of finding the right partner, spending a lot of time diving deep into 
how Ollie and his team run his channel, how they've structured part-time YouTuber Academy, all these hundreds, if not thousands of hours of work that they've put into creating materials about how to succeed on YouTube became really useful for us in the building of this agency. Luckily for us, we already had a huge team of video talent, right? So it's pretty easy for us to scale up the recruiting there and pull some of our most senior team members over to the long form side of the house. So when we look at Hey Friends, I break it apart in two ways. So strategy exists in one domain, and then the actual production process exists in another. So if you think about production, we think about research, animation, thumbnail design, video editing, writing, structuring videos, titles, all those pieces. So those are things that we could look at and say, okay, we think that we can provide these to the market better than anyone else from an agency structure. Strategy is a little bit more of a challenge, I think is how I'll say it. What we've done is we have gone out and we've talked to YouTube strategists. There's a couple that I'm sure come to mind. So when we think about, hey, friends, the way that we structure strategy is through partnership, right? So if you think about YouTube strategists, there's maybe 10 in the world that are consulting that are really proven, right? You've got the Patty Galloways and, and Jamie Rossthorne and, and a few other guys. So we decided for strategy to handle that through partnership, right? To make sure that if you come to Hey Friends and strategy is a piece of the puzzle that you need, you're not getting it through us in some watered down version. We're actually pairing you with one of the world's foremost <clears throat> YouTube strategists and then part pairing that with our production abilities. You mentioned Ali Abdal's part-time YouTuber Academy. For people mm -hmm. who don't know what that is, can you explain a little bit more of what that is? And also, how does this fit in with that? Is it complementary to it? Will he be stopping the Part-Time YouTuber Academy? Part-Time YouTuber Academy was this masterclass that Ali and his team created to essentially take you all the way from the idea of, I have a goal to create a YouTube channel and start with zero subscribers or going from, Hey, I've got a hundred thousand subscribers and I'm trying to figure out how to turn that into a million or 2 million. So it was really a masterclass and a course that they developed to tackle that. That included things like community, office hours, all kinds of really cool, a special guests that would come in and talk about their channels, things like that. And it's been hugely impactful to a ton of people that have taken part-time YouTuber Academy and turned that into meaningful YouTube growth. Today, the way that it's thought about at a conceptual level, I think there's roughly a thousand dollar price point that gets you access to that course and that community all the, the information that they've created, that they've packaged and recorded. And that's about a grand. So that is looked at as, hey, do it yourself. And then I know that they've introduced a price point that includes some kind of consulting or time with the team. I think it's somewhere around like the $5,000 mark, roughly. So it's, hey, we'll help you do it a little bit. So there's a little bit of guidance, a little bit of handholding there. And then when you look at Hey Friends, that is where you go into the category of, we'll do it for you. So that's the laddering, right? So if you think about it from a funnel, it goes one, five, and then say 10, right? Pay friends is at the bottom of that funnel to where it's really for people that are going to be the most serious about their growth or creators that have already proven out an interesting niche and have grown on YouTube, but are now looking to just focus on creating the content their audience loves and less on having to manage a team of freelancers or spend hours or days editing a video, they're looking to really outsource that in a trusted way with a partner and not necessarily a, a diverse team of freelancers that can be really difficult to manage. Talking more broadly about creators, when you work with someone like Ali or someone like Sahil or someone like Danco, why partner with creators? And usually at a high level, what does this partnership look like? Is it like a revenue share agreement? Is it an equity based deal? What does that look like? Yeah, the idea behind partnering with creators, like if you think about the people that you just mentioned, they're all experts at what they do, right? So it starts with the idea that I want to make sure that when we build a business, 
we are seeking out someone that is at the absolute top of their field, like the 0.001% top of the top, just absolute experts, because then it allows us to build a service that provides the highest quality of delivery to our customers, period. And so that's our focus. So really there, I think it, it starts with customer obsession, right? I think if you look at the video market, whether it's short form or whether it's long form, hey friends, it's fragmented. Can you say that it's competitive and that there's a lot of players in the space? Absolutely. But can you say that there's a dominant player or a brand that stands out above all the rest and is super trusted? No, you cannot. And so for us, the creator serves that purpose to really serve as the foundation of how we build the service around their expertise, their intellectual property, if you will, and really from day one, communicate that this is the brand, this is the service in this market or in this space that is the highest quality and then has the opportunity to become the most trusted and then hopefully dominant in the space. And then the way that we think about the deal structure, this is something that's funny because now that we're, we've been really public about our businesses and I've been trying to build in public as much as I can, I see so many comments that come through. It's like, how do I partner with a creator or, or how do you do this? And I hate to say it, but my answer, I, I wish I could just say, you probably can't, right? Do you know them? Are they your friends? Do they trust you? If not, you're not going to just the DM, cold DM some creator and be like, yeah, let's build a business together right? It, it doesn't work that way. So for us, when Sahil and I are looking at it, at what are the businesses that we want to tackle and build, we're really starting with our friends. We're starting with people that we have a good relationship with, that we have a deep respect for their craft. And then we let the business organically build from there. Um, so these aren't like affiliate deals. They're not like some prime, let's put Logan Paul's face on this, but he knows nothing about energy drinks or whatever. These are true partnerships with creators that are masters of this craft. And they're, they're really heavy collaborators in the business. One thing I was a little confused by before, but I think I have the answer to now is when you launch, you have this huge thundercloud from creators. They drive mm -hmm. a bunch of leads and sales for the business that you're partnering with them on. Maybe the end of year two, year three. How much impact are they actually having on the business? And is it worth the equity that you give up when partnering with them? So that was my initial thought. But one thing I've noticed with the types of companies that you've been launching is that all of these are premium services. Mm -hmm. And ultimately, it seems like you only need one Thunderclan because then, because you're servicing your clients at such a high level mm -hmm. and your product is just so good, they have word of mouth growth after that. So it's like they just refer Absolutely. more people. And so demand after that doesn't seem to be an issue. Yeah. But yeah, I'm curious, how do you think about it from your perspective? I think that there's a really simple formula, honestly. When we look at the way that we approach these, we are trying to make sure that from day one, the brand is really developed. We want to make sure that we've got the right storytelling. We want to make sure that we've got the authors dialed in, although we iterate our pricing models all the time. And we want to make sure that when the brand gets announced, there is a depth of success stories and examples of the work that are already there. And that comes from us kind of building some of these things behind the scenes quietly. And so when we look at that, yeah, there's that thunderclap, there's this huge burst of initial energy. And from there, it goes into this relentless focus on just providing the best value for our customers, right? My formula that I believe holds true for all of our businesses, and we don't spend a dollar on any marketing. We don't have any, we don't have any internal marketers at our team. We're able to avoid all of that. And instead everything is organic. Everything is inbound. And the thing that is most crucial to us is making sure that we are insanely responsive about everything. If a customer has a question, we're answering them within minutes. If an email comes in or if a loom video comes in with feedback, whatever it may be that we're there and we're on top of it really quickly. I think people underestimate the power of that responsiveness. Even if you have an unhappy customer, but you 
provide a really thoughtful response that shows that you're on top of it and you're going to fix this issue and you do it within minutes, you're going to de-escalate that situation really quickly. So for me, I think that happy customers can become advocates and advocates can help spread your brand. And so we incentivize referrals and we incentivize really easy ability for our customers to send more customers our way. And that's been tremendously successful for us. So we see a lot of growth in the businesses directly resulting and kind of those referral opportunities. Speaking more about the model, right? So we partnered with Sampar and Cody Sanchez on the editing agency, the short form editing, and so on animation, Sahil on the design. It's all productized services, whereas mm -hmm. a lot of people are thinking about software or other different models. Why did you pick this specific model to go with? I do want to clarify that our ambitions are much larger than yeah. productized services, right? But having gone the venture capital route when I was younger, I knew that I never wanted to raise a dollar of money again. Both Sahil and I are fortunate that we've done well and that we could invest our own personal capital, but then it almost feels like we're cheating a little bit to ourselves. And so part of the challenge there was how could we build a massive business and just bootstrap it from zero? And so that's where productized agencies came into play because I'd spent the past five years running a, a relatively large agency and the eight figures of revenue per year. And it was a space that when we looked at the idea of creating these agencies with recurring revenue, it is just incredibly fragmented. And I could talk about that for hours because I think there's this horrible trend that's happening right now to where people like freelancers or designers, especially are looking at some examples of success in this space and trying to copy paste that model without any critical thought. And I don't think that's a good idea whatsoever. But for us, when we looked at the productized agencies, we saw an opportunity to partner with creators that were subject matter experts, build a really great business behind it that we could scale and scale very fast. It's easy to build an agency. It's easy to say, okay, I can do this service a little bit. I'm going to build a, a website and I'm going to charge a price. And now I've got an agency. It's really hard to scale an agency and it's really hard to do it with great margins. It's really hard to do it with a great team. So for us, we looked at this and we said, okay, if we start with zero and we do these agencies, will people try and copy them? Absolutely. But could we have a moat there? And our belief was that there is a moat that is operational. It's an ability to scale. And then it's the ability to build that brand and that awareness so quickly. So for us, we said, look, let's build these businesses. Let's build a bunch of them. That way we have this ability to vertically integrate anything we want to do in the future. And we have this massive free cash flow engine that's generating a ton of revenue with great margins. And we can take that money and invest it in things that are a little bit of grander scale, right? And anything that would ever potentially become a cost center for us in terms of brand or design or marketing or whatever it could be is now a profit center, right? So that's the real long-term vision there. So the productized agencies are just this first insane nine to 12 month sprint of getting roughly 10 of them out there. And then our kind of goal right now is to head to 25 million in ARR from the first suite of productized agencies. And hopefully each of them will become really a dominant player in their category. One of your tweets says agencies have a lot of competition. It's inevitable, mm -hmm. yet there's a huge gap in skill for operations. Mm -hmm. One person design agency easily copied. Scale a global team of elite designers in 30 days, difficult to execute. Harder to execute equals more moat. How mm -hmm. do you think about building a moat? And in your case, where it's operations and scaling, how did you get so good that you have this operational excellence that allows you to separate yourself from the rest? Well, in terms of operational excellence, like, <laughs> I don't know if I'd use those words. M maybe so. I think it comes down to this idea of, of earned insights, right? Um, having built some pretty cool businesses over the years, but having been very private in the process of doing so, like I, I never tried to build an audience or a brand or any of that stuff. 
And when we stumbled into assembly, it just made a lot of sense to try and build the brand and just say, like, okay, if we're going to do this, like we're going to put all of our energy, all of our effort into it, but let's go big and let's just build it in public. So I struggled first. What the hell do I talk about? And really with a push from Solly is dude, like there's probably 10,000 things that are incredibly obvious to you that are not obvious to 99% of people. And I think it just comes from experience. It comes from years of trial and error and lots of just like blood and sweat left out there on the battlefield. I think that having been bootstrapping businesses for a long time, you just get really scrappy. Having had the good fortune of having to scale a couple companies really quickly, I learned some things. And I, I also think I just have a, a unique perspective on a lot of this to where I don't know if contrarian is the word that I would use, but there's so many things in business that just don't make sense to me, especially with agencies. It's why do you need that step or why do you need to do this? Just cut that out. If you look at all of our agencies, they're productized, they use few meetings. There are incredibly rigid standards of how we document the work that we do, how we capture information. If you look at off menu, which is cranking out on a given month, maybe anywhere between five to eight, like really world-class brands per month at this point, the way that we go about creating those brands, it takes us like three weeks and a company, no matter how big you are, we just rebranded a company that raised $150 million and it cost them 30 grand, right? If they went to a traditional agency, it would cost them 300 grand. But for us, like we don't care because it checks our boxes of how our process has to work, how we need to hit our margins internally. And does it check the box of this is a brand that's going to go into the wild and is going to make us look better. And as long as all those things are there, like we can go. But in developing that brand, we cut out so many steps. There's normally all this mood boarding and like doing all these concepts and this big reveal and like trying to convince the client of this idea and whatever. And an agency will spend weeks and weeks of time just on, frankly, what I think is nonsense, like work that doesn't actually make the, the end result any better. It ends up being all this work that you do to try and justify your price point or justify like the argument to the client of, oh, this is why we had seven designers on this. And this is why it took us two months. And I'm like, dude, let's do a kickoff. Tell us your goals. Tell us your anti-goals. Tell us things that inspire you. We're going to start designing tomorrow and we'll show you a few concepts in a week. Pick one that you like. We'll iterate from there. And it's a super fast moving process. So I think it's just having this kind of contrarian mentality about how that process has to go that has helped us build a playbook that allows us to move really quickly. And then when you compound that across everything from hiring to handling financials, pricing, storytelling, building the brand, getting it all out there, when you put all these things together, you build this advantage of speed right? This sense of momentum. So when we're launching these companies, like I, I think one, now that we're pay friends marks like number four or five, I think people are going to start to see, oh shit, you're doing this fast. We're, we're doing this every month, literally like every month through the rest of the year, we're launching an agency. It took us 30 days to stand it up. That's it. We give ourselves 30 days to go from what do we want to build to, okay, <laughs> we've narrowed down into like the market, the competition, priced it, picked a creator done the partnership, built the brand, built the service, built the team, built the strategy, launched it in 30 days. I don't think that is easy to replicate. Yeah. So that's the moat. When you are doing, standing up these businesses in 30 days, does it feel like a lot of work or do Dude. you have it so dialed in that it's a lot easier now? I mean, it goes back to the story that you and I were talking about before this podcast. Like, why am I tired today? I was in New York. For a couple of meetings and I'm looking at my calendar because of all the flights get canceled because there's tornadoes in Chicago. I can't get home. So I have two options. I can either reschedule an entire day's worth of planning of strategy, this podcast, partnership calls, all these things, or I can take them from like my hotel at Soho house. And so it's what do I want to do. And I also have a newborn son at home that I want to hang out with. So we're at this place to where I think we're so dialed in on what we're doing and what we're achieve that the most rational thing I could come up with was well, I'm already done with my meetings for today. Like, why don't I just rent a car and drive 12 hours home overnight? That way I'm at my desk the next day and I don't have to rearrange my schedule. I don't have to take these calls from a comfort. I can come home to my son. 
Like I can be present and focused in doing what I'm doing. I think when you, to me, I'm like, that makes sense. Everybody else is, dude, you've lost your mind. And then to add on top of it, I tweet out, Hey, I'm stuck in a car. Who wants to chat strategy? Like I'll DM you, I'll give you my phone number. Let's do this. And I end up talking like on the phone with tons of interesting entrepreneurs for six hours. So I don't know, man, I think it's just all systems go. So yeah, it feels like a hell of a lot of work, uh, but we're having a ton of fun doing it because we're constantly in creation mode. We're constantly going from zero to one every month. And then on top of that, we're looking at all these businesses that we've built that we have the good fortune of turning into like pretty fast growing businesses pretty quickly. And we're getting to iterate those models every month. Honestly, I feel like a kid in a candy store. It's just that I'm spending 16 hours a day in that candy store. <laughs> Can that last? No, but be, I do love what Naval says about working like a lion. Good context is that I took a sabbatical for six months before we started this company. Like I literally fucking sat around and like just played video games and watched movies and played poker and just was a degenerate for six months. Um, and storing up the energy it's taking to do this like crazy sprint. And we'll be in a place soon to where we'll be hiring CEOs. Um, but the good thing is I think we're creating enough interest and enough people are seeing what we're doing and be like, oh shit, this is really cool that we are able to attract better talent. And so I, th I think the sprint's worth it. Talk more about how assembly came to be and then also what your vision is for the next one to five years. Looking down the road, like our vision is to build a massive business. Right. Period. I think that I'm just, I'm confident with where we're at, that we can do that. And I, I think that even a few months into it, like you can definitely say that like things are going well, but it's not like a, it's not like a for sure success yet. And that's true. But I think that all the right indicators are there that this is going the way that we want it to. The general overarching idea of assembly, assembly is a mixture of a venture studio and like a holding company, right? Our general goal is to build, invest in, or buy creator-led businesses, right? Right now we're in the stage of just building all those organically ourselves. And it's, again, it's fun. Like we're just building businesses with our friends and our friends just happen to be like really prominent creators, but that's been a blast for us. It's also very B2B focused right now and we'll continue to be for a while. And then we announced a couple of weeks ago that we're investing a million this year in, I think what we're roughly calling like our operator in residence program to where we're either finding like a really interesting subject matter expert that can either instantly become or grow to become an operator of a business and then building a business around that individual and partnering them with the right creator. And then they get the entire assembly machinery of like operations, hiring, scale, brand design, et cetera, which is this really nice flywheel that we're creating through our agencies to where let's say that we want to launch this new business. We want to launch, Hey friends, I need a brand. I need a website. Huh? Good thing that I've got off menu. I need to automate the business. Okay. Let's build an automation agency, right? So we're really looking at it every time we run into a problem to where we say, how do we do this? We just, it's insane to say it out loud actually, but I'm like, let's just build a business that does that and we'll, we'll solve that need and we'll turn a profit. Right. So that's been our focus there. And as that grows, we'll use all that cash to go and invest in businesses that we think can be drastically accelerated by a creator partner or just outright buy a business that we think we can overhaul and then accelerate through again, a creator partner, and then just generally benefit from the assembly machinery. So phase one of that is all the agencies, agency holding companies are a well-known thing. You've got like the IPGs and the publicists and I could name them for days, but I do fundamentally believe that the service as a subscription model is the future of creative services. And my focus right now is building the biggest holding company of those kinds of businesses, right? And across the board, we look at assembly as like the LVMH of creator-led businesses. So everything's in that luxury premium offering, even in a service category right now. And then we get into other like digital goods, products, things like that. Um, they'll still be at that premium level. And, um, yeah, I mean, it's a big undertaking and we're still being hush hush a little bit on what phase two looks like. So I feel a little bit like Kevin Feige from Marvel at times. I'm like, okay, like we just released Iron Man. 
we got the Hulk coming out next and like we're planning the Avengers, but we're not going to talk about it yet. We're just going to tease it. So it feels a little bit like that sometimes, <laughs> but yeah, we're having a lot of fun doing it, man. Nice. Talking more about assembly. Mm -hmm. One thing that you mentioned was this operator in residence program. Can you tell me a little bit more about the thinking there versus you just continuing to launch more and more by yourself? Part of the thinking there is it, it's less of bringing an operator in out of the cold and it's more of, okay, I have a few categories of businesses that I do want to build, right? In, in building each of those, I might need to go and find a subject matter expert to hire to run the day to day, but maybe there are some interesting businesses out there that are already doing 20, 30,000, maybe 50,000 MRR, whatever it is. And they have a good operator, but they don't have the ability to scale because again, like part of the advantage here is that scaling a service business is difficult. It, it can take a lot of years to figure out how to do that. So for us to come in and say, look, we can drastically accelerate the top of funnel and the ability to scale this business. We're going to take an equity stake. The way we structure that is going to be pretty creative and a really like great win for both parties. But that's really the model there is instead of us just having to go ahead and build this from scratch, let's just go and take ownership in a company that's already started down that path, but wants to move much faster. So it's just a, it's an overall speed boost for both parties. When you look into the future, how do you think about what proportion of the businesses you start versus you buy versus are additional services on top of your existing services? Yeah. I think that for us, I think that we can get to a place to where we can justify a hundred million dollar valuation pretty quickly, right? It's, it's not hard to do the math there, right? If you look at the amount of businesses we're spinning up, how fast they're growing, like you can get to the point where it's okay, we could make that argument, let's say next year. For us, I do think that it's really interesting to look at ways that we are raising funding, not at the whole co level necessarily, but more in for like sidecars or, or other investment vehicles where we are going out and we are buying companies, right? And plugging in, whether it's our distribution or an operating model or whatever it may be, that is of high interest to us. I think it's just making sure that we do that when we're truly ready for it. And we're not ready for that today. So right now we're going to focus on our bread and butter, which is building these productized agencies. We're beginning to explore some other spaces that aren't service businesses to build. We'll likely launch a couple of them before the end of the year, which is going to be, I don't know if it's genius or absolutely like asinine because we're already scheduled for one agency a month through the end of the year. And I'm, yo, let's build this too. So it is crazy. And maybe we should talk about whether or not there's diminishing returns of doing so many things. We we're going to get to a place where we can get access to capital and leverage just do it at the right point and with the right terms to go and chase really big, ambitious deals. How do you think about focus? Because you're launching businesses every single I month. I don't know. Unless you have things to plan for in the future. It's funny because I feel really focused. But yeah, people are asking like, why are you doing so many things? And I'm not, I'm just building assembly, right? The view that we have, and this probably only makes sense to us because we're in it day to day. We just view these things as, as just like skews, right? Like I don't view them as independent businesses. They are, they have their own teams, their own employees, their own bank accounts, like their own P and L's, like they are independent businesses, but I view them as skews in my mind. That's exactly like the image I had in, had in my head. Cause on the back end, it, it's all roughly the same, the, it's all roughly the same. system operations, et cetera, just the front offering or the actual service is slightly different and the creator is different. But everything to run the day to day is largely the same. Yeah. It's all largely the same. And that's this nice thing to where it does feel like we are running one organization because like we might have a learning in one of the agencies and it's okay. That's really interesting. Like how does that affect the rest of the businesses? And we turn those learnings into just like iterative points to make every business better. And so what we're really learning is that when there's a win or there's a loss, there's a lesson in there that can then benefit the rest of the businesses because they are so similar. They're all productized service businesses. They're just in different categories, right? So in that regard, it does feel like a bunch of different SKUs. 
The issue though now is that the businesses are getting bigger and we're really ambitious about how we think about that. When you release this episode, we're launching Hey Friends right after we're launching the next iteration of Off Menu, right? Um, and with that, I'll go, we can go ahead and talk about it now. So Off Menu is $15,000 a month. Um, it is a subscription, but it's inherently high churn. And that's okay because we have so much demand that our one-time revenue in a month can be two or three times high as our MRR. So our MRR might be 100K, but we might do another 200 in just one-time revenue. Great, that business is making money. But of course, we want to stabilize the churn. We want to stabilize and have some better prediction of recurring revenue. Back to what we talked about earlier about everybody kind of copy pasting this productized like design model. I've been watching it very quietly and thinking through, okay, what is the right way that we could scale this team at a global level, but introduce a price point that is very low churn, very retentive, and also widens the funnel of companies that we can accept into off menu. And so off menu is going to be launching a la carte, pun intended, which is a $5,000 a month design offering. It is not unlimited because we're not even going to go there. It is a fixed offering, but the benefit is that we've been very quietly. I don't know if you see my tweets where I've been like, Hey, we're hiring. Gotten hundreds of amazing portfolios from talent all across the world. And, and one of the biggest beliefs about this is like talent is globally distributed, but opportunity is not right. So with a la carte, we're opening up this access to this global team of amazing designers that are managed very carefully by very senior seasoned designers. There's a very careful process that we've built under the hood of how all this works. And so you can come in at this $5,000 a month price point. You can get incredible value, work with amazing designers across brand, web, product, whatever it is that you need on an ongoing basis. And we get to give a really great salary and package to those designers, whether they're in like Nigeria, for example, or just some of the most like random places around the globe where you'd be like, there's a ton of talented designers there. And it's like, yeah, they don't have any opportunity. So I, I think there's this really amazing thing that we can do with a la carte to still provide a tremendous amount of value to companies and also expand our reach and our design team really aggressively while training up these designers and hopefully giving them more access to opportunity in the future as well. And honestly, man, with that and with the size of the distribution that we have, my full expectation is that once we roll that out, if we do it the right way, it, it becomes a very clear and dominant leader at that price point. How do you square that with the types of margins that you want to hit? It's very achievable. Right. Yeah. And, and that's where the scale comes into play. I think that's where the operational advantage comes into play is just like, okay, if you really break that down, you look at it at a financial level, like how do we still squeeze 60% margins out of that price point? And there's a lot of math that goes into thinking about, okay, how do we, what do we offer for that price point? What do you get? What's the likelihood of somebody, uh, of every customer using that to its full potential every month? building averages from there, thinking about how teams kind of share work and capacity, thinking through 15 years of design experience to understand how long things can take, and then building a really tight model around that. That's been really important to us. And you'll be able to scale it up. So you can come in at five grand. If you're like, I need a little bit more, you can essentially scale that up to six or seven grand, whatever it is. So it's going to grow with you. And then it can, you know, reach back up to that $15,000 a month price point. But it's just, it's an insane offer. We've been testing it with some people. It's going incredibly well. My kind of goal is that once we roll that out, I genuinely believe that a la carte will hit a $2 million run rate within a month or two. Are you worried about competition at all? How do you think about competition? There's going to be competition, of course. But again, for us, I think that the scale in which we're moving, the, the speed in which we're moving and the scale that we have from distribution just gives us so much of an advantage. And frankly, Alex and I talked about StoryArb 
obviously I'm very familiar with Alto Studios that Steve and Ramin did, because guess what? Off Menu did the brand. We did the whole thing, right? We're very familiar with, with these things. When you look at that stuff, I, I think there becomes a saturation, right? So a great example of this is Nick Huber. Nick has had some success with Ari Koseg that he built and used his audience for distribution. He's like, oh, this works. And he's gone and he's partnered with or built a bunch of businesses around his audience. And it's okay. There's a lot of interesting stuff that's going on here, but how much business can his audience support? And so I think there becomes a saturation point. For us, every business has its own unique creator. So instead of just like launching 10 businesses to 300,000 people, I'm launching 10 businesses to 30 million people. So is there an opportunity for somebody to come and compete with one of our agencies? Yeah, probably. But again, to us, it's a skew, right? So if there's competition and somebody comes and competes with off menu and this year, instead of doing, I don't know, 5 million in revenue off menu only does four, that's okay. Cause I've got 10 other businesses, right? And then when you look at the compounding effects of all of those businesses together, I have, I have a, a pretty strong ability, I think for us to really pour gas on those fires. If we think there is a, if there is a competitive issue and to really hit that hard. But again, it comes back to like positive some games. Like these are service businesses right now in the service landscape. There has never been ever in any domain a one winner take all kind of approach. It, it's not search engines. It's not social media, right? They have been and always will be environments where you can be very friendly with your competition and there can be a ton of room for success for everybody. So for the most part, when it comes to competition, like I'm literally telling people in real time, like how we're doing things. If you take that and again, like positive some games, you run with that and you build a business. Awesome. Like I'm here to root for you. But what I'm not going to root for is just absolute copy paste of ideas without any critical thought that then becomes these like really sleazy cash grabbing opportunities without a focus on the customer at the core of what you're doing that I won't root for. But for people that want to come out and just kick ass for their customers and build a great business, hell yeah, I'm here for you. What makes a good manager? I don't know. I, I, maybe I'm a shit manager. I don't know. I think it's just, it's communication and expectation. I keep this book on my desk at all times and I don't care how trite it is. This is my favorite book of all time. And I read this right when it came out and even just the first paragraph where Ray Dalio says, I want to establish that I'm a dumb shit who doesn't know much relative to what I need to know. I was like, this is my book. This is it. And so that really influenced everything I believe about management, which is that the best way that I can manage is to think very critically about what we're doing and communicate that very carefully. So writing down everything that I can, building systems, building processes, um, and SOPs across the board to make it very clear that if this, then that, and then communicate my expectations really carefully. So I know as a manager, I've created an exact guide to how to do this. So if I'm hiring you because you've shown that you have the creative ability or the skill set that's needed, and I give you this guide and I give you very clear expectations and I help you develop, I answer your questions very thoughtfully. I push you in the right way. Hopefully you can succeed. If you can't, then this probably isn't the relationship that is going to work for us because that's for me, at least individually, that's how I know how to manage people. Right. And is that the best way to do it? I can't say, probably not, I don't know, but it works really well for us. And being so detail oriented in the way that we create those systems and those process for our team members allows us to grow our teams really fast. And it's, that's not even just with assembly. That's even in the past from other companies where we've had to go and figure out well, how do we hire 30 senior react engineers in two months and keep a great culture. I've been doing this for a long time. And I think that there's something there. And that documentation and that process. So that's the way that I go about managing personally and just setting really clear expectations. And then for me, the way that I, I view my job is three things. I think my job is just three simple things is to think is to communicate and it's to recruit. That's it. And so by doing that and, and communicating very often with our team and, and being very clear in my thinking and my ideas and my expectations, I think it's led to a lot of trust and it's worked really well.
yesterday, when you were on the drive back to Chicago, there were a few people that asked some questions in the chat. And so I'm just going to read out the tweets. And then if you were to respond to these questions that they have, what you would say. Sure. So the first one is from at Alex and Books. How do you find the talent and team for your agency once you've identified a service need? Alex and Books is awesome, yeah. by the way. Um, if you don't follow him on Twitter, you should, if you're a book nerd, um, uh, how do I find the talent? One is, I think that for us, we do have, again, like an advantage over most companies in the space for recruiting because it's a, I'm being very public about everything we're doing. And then when our creator partners announce the business, their entire audience sees it. And there is this kind of hype that comes with, oh, this is a YouTube agency. Cool. But it's all the Abdal's YouTube agency. Right. And so those little things go a long way for us in terms of recruiting. We are fully remote. I don't care about your time zone. We hire on a global level. And then there's like the async component that allows us to, to do that really well. We offer pretty insane advantages for team member referrals. So we'll just give you a month's salary pretty much. If you refer somebody, I don't care if you're making 200 grand a year. If, if you bring somebody in that we keep for 90 days, here's $16,000. Like it, it doesn't matter. The second question is from Jess Chan. How do you build a 90 day game plan to systematizing and scaling revenue for a seven figure agency that has grown entirely through word of mouth? In my mind, it becomes a channel question. So if you have grown a business to seven figures word of mouth, I think the first question is, is that channel tapped out or can we pour gas on that fire? Right. And if we can pour gas on that fire, we believe there's room left to grow. I think one for word of mouth, you're talking about referrals, right? So you're talking about re-engaging a lot of your previous customers, offering really interesting like referral packages for them. That tends to be pretty successful for us. And then I'd also look at other channels. I'm sure that Jess, who's an absolute killer, I, I think she probably knows some other channels that have the tendency to perform well. So it's a question of like, how do we take the success that we've had word of mouth? If you think about word of mouth, it's probably people being like, oh, we worked with them and their customer service was great. Or they delivered X result for us and we loved it, right? Turn those into stories and then just try and tell that story in as organic a manner as you can and maybe put dollars behind it if you have to. Um, but for us, like right now, I'm a huge believer in Twitter for acquisition for companies like this. We've tested a bunch of sources and I have six sales calls today. And when I look at every single one of them, how'd you hear about us? The answer is Twitter. Got it. So like, I absolutely can say that I've built a mid seven figure business in two months off of Twitter. The power of Twitter is just incredible. If you enjoyed this episode, please subscribe and leave a review. And if you enjoyed listening to Hunter, you can follow him on Twitter at underscore Hunter Hammonds 